you get a man that is a teen man all the way, such men are real men and an asset in all areas of life. No one is alone. No one is independent. We are all parts of the great scheme of things, and we must fit well. His work led to BYU's first Department of Physical Education and the bestowal of that department's first undergraduate degree. His foresight prompted the church to adopt scouting as part of the young men's program. His spirited enthusiasm was responsible for the celebration of BYU's first homecoming. He wasn't on the board of trustees or even a university president. He was a BYU athletic director named Eugene L. Roberts. Gene was born in Provo in 1880. Early on, he displayed enormous enthusiasm for physical activities. He transformed his backyard into a combination outdoor gymnasium, racetrack, and boxing arena. He learned prize fighting from Willard Bean, the Mormon Cyclone, Utah's greatest turn of the century athlete. Performing in a local circus troupe, he did a wire walking act, juggling, twirling baton, and climbing a ladder, all while on the wire for the A.G. Barnes Circus. And yet, when it came time to settle into a profession, it seemed Gene would be destined to leave behind all that he loved. Instead of engaging in physical training and being paid for it, I was compelled to accept a position as a teacher in an elementary school. The reason? Lack of funds. I found myself facing 44th graders, and frankly, I didn't know what to do with them. After three years, Gene had enough, and he gave up teaching. An excellent writer, he was promptly offered the position of editor for the Utah County Democrat. Instead, he accepted a mission call. On his return home, economics forced him into teaching once again. Now married, he entered the University of Utah to sharpen his classroom skills. And while working out at the campus gym one afternoon, he met visiting professor William Gilbert Anderson, director of the gymnasium at Yale. Before long, Anderson offered Gene an assistantship. At Yale, I found myself one of eight young men taking special training in physical education and athletic coaching. At the end of one year, Director Anderson assured us that we were ready to accept positions anywhere in the country. One of Gene's offers came from President George H. Brimhall at BYU. Gene accepted. But when he arrived at the Y in 1910, his welcome was not what he'd anticipated. My predecessor at Brigham Young was Fred Benyon, a giant among men, and one of the state's greatest football players. Imagine what the students, especially those athletically inclined, thought when they got their first glimpse of poor little me. I was a skinny little man wearing glasses and weighing 127 and a half pounds. If Gene was less than impressive physically, his first speech as director of physical education would not win him much popularity either. High-profile athletes, he boldly announced, would not be proselyted, subsidized, or favored either for jobs or grades. Instead, promoting the character and fitness of every student would be his primary objective. Opposition to Gene's policies was immediate and to the point. A rich and influential board member remarked as he walked away, I see, the institution has nothing to expect from you. Predictions were freely made that I would not last more than one school year. The lack of resources at Gene's disposal was just as discouraging. Compared to other schools of similar size, the BYU budget was meager at best. Undaunted, Gene rolled up his sleeves and recruited unpaid volunteers. Several students taught general physical education, another taught boxing. A furniture store clerk became his wrestling instructor. Working as a jack of all trades, Gene did everything from coaching to managing equipment to directing sports information and PR. Nothing could have prepared his detractors for what upcoming semesters held in store. By the end of Gene's first year, the Y had secured a state championship in basketball. The school also boasted a winning season in baseball, a Western record in track and field, three tournament victories in tennis, a state championship in wrestling, and the first collegiate gymnastics team in the state. Gene's coaching would also bring BYU international distinction. Alma Richards arrived on campus from Parowan, Utah in 1911. Gene quickly recognized his raw talent in the high jump. When Gene mentioned the Olympics, Richards thought he was joking. Gene wasn't. They set to work. 
A year later, Richards left the Stockholm Games with a gold medal. In a career spanning 24 years, he won over 200 medals. His high jump record was eventually broken in 1917 by Clinton Larson, another BYU athlete coached by Gene Roberts. Over the next 15 years, Gene's contributions to BYU would become nearly too numerous to list. Football had been banned as unsafe. Gene had it reinstated and founded Utah's first coaching school. Football legend Newt Rockney served as guest instructor. In an era that strictly separated men's and women's physical education, Gene pioneered a variety of co-ed courses. The classes he instructed in social dance began a BYU tradition that has continued for decades. And he established other programs that would eventually become BYU's Department of Recreation Management and Youth Leadership. Finally, in 1912, he started the Tempanogos Hike. Held every year till 1971, it was hailed as the largest community mountain climb in America. The trek came complete with a retelling of an ancient Indian legend. Around the same time, Gene began writing a sports column for the Deseret News as well. There, he first coined the name Cougars, and BYU's mascot was born. And unbeknownst to nearly everyone, Gene wrote under several pseudonyms for the Provo Herald and perpetrated some intricate hoaxes in the process. He won prestige among Provoites, for example, as Harry Davidson Kemp, a celebrated Eastern journalist. With that prestige, he prodded city leaders into sweeping civic improvements, everything from paving roads to building parks. Gene always loved a good joke, especially if it was for a good cause. Never did a community hoax work better. The editor himself did not discover the identity of the writer until early August. He was furious, but compelled to keep the secret to save his own face. Finally, determined to see how far the hoax could go, Gene had Kemp arrange a Provo concert with a world-renowned but fictitious pianist. Hundreds flocked to hear Professor Koch of Vienna, who was actually Gene Roberts in elaborate disguise. Although Gene could do little more than play chopsticks and bang on the keyboard with his fists and elbows, his revolutionary style earned Professor Koch a standing ovation. In the end, Gene just couldn't bring himself to unmask. It was years before anyone knew the true identities of either Kemp or Koch. In 1928, after 17 years at BYU, Gene accepted a position in physical education at the University of Southern California. But even though his BYU career had ended, his contribution to the church at large continued. Gene arranged a USC religion course on LDS teachings that eventually became the forerunner of Church Institutes of Religion on campuses across the United States. Eugene L. Roberts was a man of many talents. He inspired not just his athletes, but all around him with determination, visionary thinking, and good humor. As a coach, a teacher, and a human being, he was truly a man who reached for the summit. <laughs>